Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Lewis, Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to our annual commemoration of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We have attendees, there's probably more than 100 of you already signed in from across the country. Um, we have a strong showing from Georgetown University, no surprise there. And if you're wondering what that's about, um, stay tuned for why. Um, for well more than a decade, Penn Nursing has honored Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with magnific magnificent speakers, and this year proves no different with our amazing keynote speaker, Dr. Roberta Waite, whose talk is titled, Reckoning with Racism in Nursing, Acknowledgement, Recognition, and Admission. Her title resonates as an always timely topic, but in particular now as nursing seeks to remedy its own ill-fated relationship with racism. We all are or should be aware of the work of the National Commission to address racism in nursing, work that Dr. King himself would have supported were he still alive. This year, the commission conducted a national survey of over 5,600 nurses and revealed, to no surprise for many of us, racism is a substantial problem for the profession. Taken directly from the commission's report, 63% of surveyed nurses have experienced racism in the workplace, with the transgressors being either a peer, a patient, or a supervisor. Further, 57% of nurses have challenged racism in work settings, but more than half said their efforts resulted in no change. This is quite disheartening, but there is hope in that many nursing leaders our keynote speaker, Dr. Waite being one of them, have been working tirelessly for decades to dismantle racism in nursing. The commission is currently seeking public comments on its draft, and I do hope you will consider reading the report and offering your own comments. So we are thrilled that Dr. Roberta Waite accepted our invitation to speak on racism in nursing. And what you may not know is that she accepted our invitation to speak, even though it's her birthday weekend. Her birthday was this past Wednesday. So all please do help me send some birth birthday blessings to Dr. Waite. And in just a bit, we will introduce her properly. As part of our annual program, we often set the stage for the keynote with an inspirational performance. This year, we have Dr. Lucinda Canty, Assistant Professor of Nursing at the University of St. Joseph, who will bless us with two of her poems. And I just want to screen share here so that you can see Dr. Canty. Um, Dr. Canty, excuse me, I'm sorry. Dr. Canty um, is a certified nurse midwife assistant professor of nursing, a researcher, and a passionate advocate for social justice, and currently provides reproductive health care. Dr. Canty's research interests are maternal mortality, health disparities, and maternal health outcomes, creating safe spaces for Black women in health care, and addressing racism in nursing and health care. Dr. Canty shares that her poetry is inspired by everyday events, and reflection of those events as a Black woman and a Black nurse midwife. Poetry has always been an important part of her life, providing her an outlet to express pain as well as triumphs that she has experienced. Please help me virtually welcome Dr. Canty as she blesses us with her poetry. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. This first piece that I'm going to share is this land we call America. I sit in the complexities of life, wondering if I will ever feel safe as a black woman on this land we call America. You call the land of the free, the home of the brave, free, brave. I wish those words could mean the same thing to me and the sons and daughters that I will birth on this land my ancestors built, this land called America. 
built on the backs of black bodies, of forgotten history, of birth, of pain, of suffering, but also of resilience and determination. It is because of black women that I am here, inflicted with 400 years of harm, still affecting the treatment of my womb. A black body I'm still trying to protect in a healthcare system where I should feel safe, but we all know I may not survive. You act like you don't see me. You pretend that you don't hear me. You turn your head away from the treatment you know is killing me. Afraid to look in my eyes. Afraid I'm going to tell you the truth. Look at me. Listen to me. You need to know my history. Wait. You need to know our collective history to know who I am, to understand why I fight just to safely give birth on this land we call America. Thank you. This next piece, The Belly of the Beast, I'm going to dedicate it to anyone who is made to feel like their history is not valued. All of our histories have value. The Belly of the Beast. I fell deep within the belly of the beast to understand that your truth was full of lies. Not just any white lies, lies that would question my worth, my history, my values, my pain, my life, that could end my life diminish my dreams. I had to go deep within the belly of the beast to understand that you don't want me here. You want me to remain silent and invisible. You don't want me to survive. You created this narrative to make me believe that I'm not good enough to achieve the American dream. I had to go deep within the belly of the beast to know that you created this reality that you wanted me to live, but that that was not my reality to live. You wanted me to live a life where I could not be free and be my authentic self. That was a difficult pill to swallow, to know that another human being could treat me that way. I had to go deep within the belly of the beast to know that I would have to use your oppressive system to give me strength, to liberate me from your ignorant imagination, to dismantle your story so I could re-examine mine. Now I can clearly see that my strength, my passion, my love, my heart, my people, my life are my paths out of the belly of the beast. That's my story. Now it's time for you to live in my truth. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, I'm honored to be here. Well, Dr. Kenti, and we are honored that you uh, cho chose to be with us this afternoon. Um, I don't know if anyone of you all are looking in the chat. So Dr. Wade, lots of birthday congratulations to you from across the country. Dr. Kenti, uh, virtual snaps up uh, for your wonderful and powerful poetry. I have um, goosebumps after listening to those powerful pieces. Um, as a bit of housekeeping, I will ask that uh, if you have questions, or Dr. Waite, um, as you listen to her lecture, please place them in the Q&A um, as opposed to the chat function. You'd have a better, um, there's a better opportunity to have the question asked if you put it in the Q&A box. Um, so thank you for that. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you all Dr. Antonia Tony Villaruel, Professor and Margaret Bond Simon Dean of the School of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania. Dean Villaruel is the sixth dean of our School of Nursing and an accomplished and pioneering 
bicultural and bilingual nurse researcher whose work has made a significant impact on improving the health of underserved Latino communities. She's internationally known for her widely used intervention, Cuidate, Take Care of Yourself, for Hispanic teens. She's known for advocating for health equity and diversification of the nursing profession, and much more, all while she works tirelessly to make Penn Nursing the preeminent intellectual and transformative force in improving health through nursing. Dean Villarreal, would you step up to the virtual podium to share with us a few remarks and to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Roberta Waite. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. And Dr. Canny, thank you for sharing your truth with us. Uh, I have mentioned to you that I've long been an admirer of your work and we are very privileged to have you with us. And I hope this is the first of many, many more visits to Penn. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us at Penn Nursing for this special event to honor Martin Luther King Jr. As many of you know, Penn Nursing continues to be ranked the number one school of nursing in the world. But with that recognition comes the responsibility to stand at the forefront of ensuring good health for everyone. It is because of this responsibility and privilege that we have long included social justice in our mission and values. As nurses, midwives, nurse scientists, and as we prepare the next generation in these fields, we are uniquely challenged and positioned to dismantle structural racism in where we learn, teach, and practice. That work starts by examining structures, processes, and policies that promote inequities and create new ones to ensure equal access and opportunity. At Penn Nursing, we have challenged all of our departments and units to examine how business is done. Changes have resulted in being intentional about how we conduct meetings, who is at the table, how we hold ourselves accountable for what and how we say things, refining policies such as not requiring GRE scores for PhD admissions, examining our own curricula to assess where biases may occur, and to develop strategies for more inclusive and more anti-racist education. We started this journey before the dual pandemics of 2020. And while we have made good practice, we have much more to do. Yet I am inspired by the commitment of our faculty, staff, and students on this journey. And I'm especially grateful to our students who rightfully hold us accountable. We speak about Dr. King's legacy in many ways, but for those of us in healthcare, we often return to his observation that injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and most inhumane of all forms of inequality. As nurses, we lead the way by living up to Dr. King's example and doing the work to correct injustice in healthcare and beyond. Please join me in thanking Dr. Lisa Lewis for making this year's annual commemoration of Dr. King possible. The keynote speaker for this year's event and an example of nurse-led change making an action and someone I have personally admired, Dr. Roberta Waite. She is, as Lisa mentioned, the new Dean of the Georgetown University School of Nursing, and I couldn't be prouder, and she will begin that role in July of this year. Dr. Waite earned her master's degree in nursing at Penn Nursing, and also did a two-year postdoctoral fellowship on the former T32 on vulnerable women, children, and families. She is well known in the area for her work as the Associate Dean for Community-Centered Health and Wellness and academic integration at Drexel University's College of Nursing and Health Profession. And that has been her role prior to becoming Dean at Georgetown. Dr. Waite has a reputation for centering health and racial justice, not just through her scholarship and research, but through creating the Macy Undergraduate Leadership Fellow Program at Drexel, which is an interdisciplinary leadership development program for students in the nursing school and the School of Public Health that fosters critical consciousness using a social justice lens. Among her many career accomplishments, she is on the leadership team of Healing Empowerment Advocacy Learning Prevention Action Trauma-Informed Pennsylvania, co-chairing the Racial and Communal Trauma Prevention Action Team. And she is on the advisory group for COACH, which stands for the Collaborative Opportunities to Advance Community Health. 
She has been involved in many cross-sector collaborations tying together health systems and community-based organizations to address community health needs in greater Philadelphia. Thank you, Dr. Waite, for joining us today and for sharing your insights. And of course, congratulations again for your exciting new work with Georgetown. We know that you will do, continue to do great things with the program and know that your Penn community is here always to support you. And with that, I give you Dr. Roberta Waite. Thank you. Well, I'm getting my slides set up here. Um, I so appreciate the warm wishes for birthday wishes and the wonderful creative piece with Dr. Canty. So it is an honor to be in virtual session with you this evening for Penn Nursing's annual commemoration of Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King spoke clearly about three evils, poverty, racism, and militarism. This evening, I will be leading this discussion on reckoning with racism in nursing. And as I move through this presentation, especially for my fellow nursing colleagues, I want you to consider when asked what stories will future nurses reflect back and say about nursing and racism during our time, what role will you play? And to start, I also wanted to just identify, I have no disclosures, financial disclosures, or conflict of interest. However, I do think it's important that I disclose that I come to this conversation as a daughter of a black woman who was a nurse, a black as a black woman myself who is a nurse, as a proud mother of two black children who are nurses, and as a descendant of enslaved people who had to be resilient in the face of legalized oppression and bondage. To set the roadmap for my discussion today, I plan to set the context for a discussion on racism, diving the race, racism, and the nursing profession, highlight the importance for nursing to acknowledge, recognize, and admit to participation in racism, and discuss the necessity for nurses to live a core value of our profession, and that is social justice. So this time is used to honor Dr. Martin Luther King. And this quote illustrates a message of hope and resilience. In December 1964, King stated, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. And this truth comes from being informed and intentional action is needed to create this change. So to start, what I'd like to do is to talk about why should we talk about racism in nursing? There is a lot of power in the question why. And when we ask the question why as nurses, it should really force us to really dig deeper and think about the origins of racism and why it has been sustained over centuries. More poignantly, why don't we have discussions about racism and how to eradicate it in the nursing profession? These conversations need to be widespread within the nursing profession and within our country. How professional nursing defines the why racism exists is going to drive decisions about confronting it and actions towards eradicating the problem. 
we know in practice, education, research, policy, that the why of an issue drives how we frame a problem, which is inextricably linked to how we solve it. And an important term that I'm going to be talking about during this discussion is race. So I think it's important to define it. And race is a social political construct created as a system of governance or supremacy that classifies people into a social hierarchy based on invented biological demarcation, thus justifying slavery, oppression, and the exploitation of people of African descent. Consequently, race is a social and power construct. And we have to note that race is not represented in a gene. If so, we would all be the same race, regardless of the context or ge geographical location we sit. Race is, however, specific to our society and how it perceives the person where we're located. Since the 18th century, European and American physicians and scientists have explained the differences between black and white people on the basis of the perceived inherent physical, social, cultural, intellectual, and spiritual inferiority of black people justifying their dehumanization and subjugation. This lie created the ideology that has pervaded our country's consciousness and has been reinforced to pathologize blackness in our United States systems, structures, and social processes. Racism is another important term I wanna make sure is defined. And Dr. Kamara Jones, the past president of the American Public Health Association states, Racism is a system of structuring opportunities and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race. And Dr. Rume Alexander states racism are assaults on the human spirit in the form of biases, prejudices, and an ideology of superiority, which persistently calls moral suffering and perpetuates racial injustices and inequities. So as you see, there is not one single definition of structural racism, but what we know is, it, it, is that it refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing structural policies. For example, we see this in housing segregation, education, employment, benefits, earnings, media, credit, healthcare, as well as the criminal justice system. And these patterns and practices over time reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and how resources are distributed. Also, these systems exist because of us, people, laws, and policies created. There are no racist systems without racist people, and there are no broken systems without broken people. Understanding racism requires us to confront ourselves within the context of history and today. Systems inform behaviors and norms within society. Over the past two years, there has been a flood of recognizing racism as a public health crisis. Nursing has also made declaratory statements. However, for nursing to confront the racism, colonialism, and other systemic oppressive forces at work, nurses must first look inward. We must dissect how we cling to racist narratives of personal responsibility and choice without understanding structures of oppression. As I move through this presentation, 
keep this quote at the forefront of your mind. James Baldwin is one of my favorite. And he state, stated, history as nearly no one seems to know is not merely something to be read and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. Reflect on how you have come to understand the roots of racism, where it stems from, and why it has been a central focal point, why it has not been a central focal point in nursing. Understanding, acknowledging, recognizing, and admitting the why is pivotal. We are living seeds history has planted, and these seeds have been fertilized over time. As nurses, we must see ourselves as historical beings, and moreover, see that history has something to say about our present day profession, and what we uphold, and what we resist. Also, think about this. From the beginning, we are all created equal, and only circumstance and history make us what we appear to be on the outside. And history is a thread that needs to be picked up in nursing. It is essential for the challenging conversations we need to be having with ourselves, each other, and our students. And as discussed a moment ago, race, which is both a social and power construct, to support structural racism is deeply rooted in the United States and the profession of nursing because the profession was birthed from the same soil. Nursing is not a historical. While the profession of nursing is immense, and we have a track record of being the most trusted profession, rated the highest for our ethics and honesty, how are we truly leveraging this status beyond what we have done so far? We must not just stop at cultural competence and diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Rooting out the core driver, producing racial injustice in our profession is necessary. Bolder steps beyond calling out racism in general is necessary. How willing are nurses to name and dismantle racism operating in our own profession, domain, not merely external in the broader culture? Historically, racism is a built-in innate product of colonialism. And because of this rootedness in the United States, like our country, the profession of nursing should take a groundwater approach to tackling racism. This knowledge, not that it merely exists, but why racism exists in nursing, which can lead to groundwater solutions with actions and committed resources. We must speak about racism explicitly rather than commonly used concepts of DEI and implicit bias. Language must reveal our problems related to racism and not obscure it with language that may be more palatable for some to hear and align themselves with. Part of the difficulty faced in even naming racism in the academy is that nursing is seen as inherently fair and non-judgmental cloaked in colorblind pride. Also, nurses are perceived, perceived as great levelers who treat people equally, regardless of race, culture, gender, income, social status, and all other intersectional identities. 
While inclusive, anti-racist care will certainly be true of the practices of some nurses. Yet at a profession-wide level, nursing has long-standing history of collective denial and a culture of silence as it relates to racism or any act of racist or discriminatory acknowledgement. Discomfort with these conversations tend not to be welcome. And recent statements and demands over the past two years have urged nurses to respond to racism when they see it occur. And that fundamentally speaks to interpersonal interactions. To have different outcomes though than in the past, nurses must do individual and collective work and advance efforts that promote sustainability through structural changes. It's important to be historically informed because nurses who are historically informed appreciate how our own historical locations shape our understanding and our responses to our colleagues, patients, families, and communities, along with our own our educational and policy approaches, especially when relating to those whose backgrounds and experiences are different from our own. Nurses also who are historically informed appreciate how our own historical locations shape our understanding of the past and current political, social, economic, and cultural issues in order to engage in difficult conversations, those that open deep wounds. Considering these elements, nurses would then know how to examine how their own belief and value systems, assumptions, and biases concomitant to the profession's expectations and the institutional and organizational structures shape their practice, particularly in relation to colonial practices that perpetuate racism. And these colonial practices have deep roots. While the role of professional nursing emerged in the late 19th century amid the end of legalized slavery, ideas and beliefs about equality for people racially identified as Black did not change with the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Legal proclamations don't change what's in the hearts and minds of individuals with an ideology of white supremacy. And like the broader culture, institutional bias against racialized Black individuals was prominent from the inception of professional nursing in the United States. Even today, it can be hard for some to imagine how nurses can oppress and perpetuate racism given that the profession is based on humanitarian efforts. However, language of caring, having a good heart, being the most trusted profession has allowed racism to remain unacknowledged and rendered silent among many in the profession. That is until the explosive activism with recent social unrest. Confronting the covert internalization and expression of racism within the nursing profession is necessary. Race silence and denial of racism bastardizes our directive of advocating for social justice. It also negates a growth mindset, which we should be modeling for less seasoned nurses as well as nursing students. Collectively, nurses must act to be on the side of history that really resonates with our written values. Getting comfortable with discomfort and walking the walk is required. We cannot merely write or talk about anti-racism and social justice with performative statements or have singular position statements developed in organizations with no resources or a manner of accountability to the work carried out by the institution. And as we think about racism, this quote by Maya Angelou really resonates. In Maya Angelou's statement on racism, she says, the ubiquity of racism in nursing is insidious entering into our minds as smoothly and quietly and invisibly 
as floating airborne microbes enter into our bodies to find lifelong purchase in our bloodstreams. The mainstream narrative of historic nursing focuses on Florence Nightingale and a society that consistently centers whiteness will also view nursing history through a white Eurocentric lens that traditionally has not recognized the many black and brown racialized populations who have served as community healers and midwives. For example, among African individuals who were stolen from their homes in Africa and brought to the U.S. as enslaved individuals in the 1600s were trained in practicing midwives. As enslaved women, they continue to provide primary pregnancy and birthing care to other African enslaved women and as required to white women. This continued even after the emancipation, lacking prominence in nursing's historical recognition are the stories about women, such as Mary Siegel, a Jamaican who nursed British, French, Russian, and Sardinian soldiers during the Crimean War. Surgeon of Truth, Harriet Tubman, and Susie Taylor, who nursed so soldiers during the Civil War. Namayako Sakam Curtis, who served as a contract nurse during the Spanish-American War. Mary Eliza Mahoney and Mary Elizabeth Carnegie. It is also important to understand that nursing faculty and leaders cannot teach and practice what they do not know. It is paramount that we are informed more comprehensively and critically about our history to avoid the unconscious embodiment of the partisan, tainted, sanitized, and opportunely forgotten history that has promulgated ethnocentrism in nursing. When we think about racial attitudes um, and educational discrimination, racially black and brown women were restricted or denied admission to the United States nursing schools. So these are some examples that I have listed here of some of the schools that were created to support the education of nurses that were excluded from other academic programs due to stifling racist practices and ideology. Comparably, because racism is such an enduring structure, institutions and healthcare perpetuated separateness, which was seen also in not just education, but employment, as well as professional organization. And as we noted earlier, when we have separation or racial segregation, this is not a natural state. This is a state that is socially constructed. So a historical reckoning is needed for nursing because it can lead us to different kinds of a present and future. History is instructive, not because it offers us a blueprint for how to act in the present, but it does help us ask better questions, acknowledge, recognize, and admit the harms that have been inflicted on excluded populations. It offers us insight into the past, which can help us create a better future. Also, a Nightingale imagery of nursing uses caring as a deflection. This avoids deep reflection to see where harm has been done and what needs repairing. Nursing has to address the racist and imperial harms of our discipline so that we can rectify them in the present and future and build toward a reality where mutuality, reciprocity, equity, and justice are possible for all persons. Endeavoring to reckon with the past in this way creates the possibility for solidarity against injustice. Movement for change is difficult, but acknowledgement is key. It's difficult if racism is not acknowledged. 
An acknowledgement of our country's history is important. The need to acknowledge systemic racism and its effect over time, but nevertheless, acknowledge our, our histories, our nation's original sin, which is anti-Black racism. When nurses fail to acknowledge how they consciously or unconsciously engage in the system of racism, they deny the daily ignominies and injustices that make up everyday lived experiences of persons fighting against subjugation. Nurses then reinforce an inherently racist idea of white as default and certainly fail to understand the construction of their own race. Likewise, an individual orientation has been focused on understanding the impact of interpersonal racism and documenting inter individual experiences of perceived discrimination or implicit biases based on race. However, racism must also be understood both systemically as well as intrinsically. So recognition is important and recognition that being a nurse does not transcend racism. Also recognition that nursing's failure to deal with racism today is simply a reproduction of the profession's own tradition. Racism in the nursing profession would allow, if we recognize it, would allow nurses to redirect the energy that they use in denying racism toward forming alliances and organizational goals to dismantle racism. And like the broader culture, the nursing profession's unwillingness to recognize that racism is endemic in nursing and healthcare results in a lack of discussion about racism, leading to responses and actions that exacerbate the problem. Another step would be, another step would be able to recognize that many of our basic programs do not deal with race or racism. Therefore, we do not prepare nurses to have meaningful discussions about race or racism. These are key questions to reflect upon. How are nurses trained to talk about race and racism? Why is it relevant to interrogate your internalized and external narratives about racism? And I think it's important for us to recognize we come to the profession as people first. So we have our personal values. How aligned are our personal and professional values? Recognize what is your level of racial literacy? As professional nurses, we must enhance our racial literacy to engage and teach students, as well as discuss and counsel families of all races on the effects of exposure to racism as victims, bystanders, and perpetrators. Many providers and students have been trained to talk about race without talking about race. Therefore, a lack of vocabulary or skills to speak in a clear manner is missing. Racial literacy is key to understanding the contextuality of race and the relationship between race and power. Learning about race from a learner's stance is key rather than a knower's stance. This means understanding race from a socio-historical context, deconstructing ideologies that perpetuate a neutrality of race and recognizing intersectionality of all of a person's identities. It's key to understand that all elements of racial literacy are political and focused on, racial, on social justice, which is core to our profession. So when we use racial literacy, we notice when specific racial terms like black are substituted with vague social terms like urban or low income. These are code words. Again, we talk about race without using explicit language. Additionally, when we're thinking about recognition of racism, we have to recognize that colonialism has influenced nursing academia and conceptualizations of what truth is. 
Also, literature has identified that most racism in nursing is either implicit or unconscious. But we do have a need to assess our own biases and recognize that growth requires race consciousness and recognize the need to cultivate our imagination for the possibility and the courage to divest from oppressive systems, specifically anti-Blackness. It seems imperative that conversations regarding racial biases are be threaded throughout the curriculum for nurses to develop an inclusive, just, and caring professional identity. For nurses to care for all, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status, their own biases have to be illuminated and confronted. Without deliberate efforts to gain awareness of racism, nurses will perpetuate the social injustices that have existed throughout history. And we need competent white educators. They're needed to deliver consistent anti-oppressive pedagogies and to role model positive white identity. Literature has identified that many white nurses are particularly challenged to have conversations about racism due to their inability to understand their own white fragility, which comes along with defensive behaviors um, become very pervasive. But of note, we do want to recognize that prejudice occurs with all. Prejudice is a property of all people. But we have to note racism can be attributed only to those who have the power to translate their prejudice into action. Nurse educators in the literature, they agree that they are not adequately prepared to effectively support anti-racist education or prepared to address critical conversations on topics such as power, privilege, dominance, and institutional racism. So there is work to be done by us. When engaging in dialogues about racism, we also have to uh, recognize there's emotional labor that is experienced, both in speaking up and in listening. So we have to prepare ourselves for these conversations. And Dr. Daryl uh, Wing Sue, book on race talk and the conspiracy of silence can serve as a good resource. We have to strengthen our core areas such as enhancing our self-awareness, understanding how one is racially positioned. We have to pay attention to one's background and what you have been exposed to, since this influences how you think and feel. And we have to appreciate the group dynamics that are at play in these discussions, recognizing what happens between us individually and collectively. These are all shaped by history and societal forces. And a vital element to these conversations is enhancing our navigation skills. When mistakes or misunderstandings occur in conversation, having the skill set to clarify and advance the conversation is important, which means leaning into discomfort. That's going to be necessary. Making sure you have a safe space, which is not dominant centered. Have brave spaces where you can push more against the margins and most definitely have accountable spaces, applying a collectivistic approach, working together and holding people liable for decisions and actions is key. You wanna prevent an echo chamber with simple narratives about racism. So it's gonna be necessary for us to get out of our bubble and really listen to people who have to think about race all the time and are impacted by racism most of the time. We have to adopt the stance of critical racial consciousness, recognizing the implications of one's whiteness, fears of influence, and how it is replicated in our ideas. Also, we must speak about social justice. Social justice is perceived as a core principle in a nursing profession. Therefore, it's necessary to create social justice habits, particularly those dealing with issues of power, privilege, and supremacy. 
This is like any other lifestyle change. Social, political contexts and structures are going to push against you, opposing change. Setting our intentions and adjusting what we spend our time doing is essential. It's all about building new habits. Therefore, nurses cannot operate from a stance of silence, secrecy, or spectatorship. We also cannot accept obnoxious peace, where active resistance against racial injustice remains negligible within our profession. We must consider how we are part of the problem. As helpers, we don't perceive ourselves as hurting others or contributing to an oppressive system. We do have biases. We partake in microaggression, which is violence, and prejudice. These are all equal opportunity conditions. And professional training, which is our educational degrees, our expertise, which might be our certifications, they do not remove us from the impact of our culture, upbringing, wounds, passions, identities, and privileges or our advantages. Critically understanding the problems that create racial injustice and enhancing our self-knowledge, our self-examination, our role in upholding oppressive systems, and how it can be challenged ought to be central to our work. We have to ask ourselves, what about my sociopolitical lens can promote racial justice? What is my personal experience with leading change towards anti-racism? How does my identity impact leading change I wish to see in the profession? How and when will I gain the skills needed to act towards this change? We also cannot talk about race and racism without introducing the concept of power. Access to power is influenced by one's economic and political status and networks. Power has more to do with control, influence, or authority over others. But a common unspoken assumption about power in our society is that unequal power relations are part of the natural order of things, therefore inevitable and unchangeable. In nursing, who generally holds positional power? But we must recognize that power relations are not based in nature, but are socially constructed and therefore changeable. From a nursing perspective, we have to understand power, understand how it works and who has it. Nurses tend to avoid confronting, naming structural systems of power as their effects on their profession. So since our goal ultimately is to promote anti-racism, if we truly have that as a priority for nursing, we must build an anti-racist structural competency skill set. And we must be accountable for the history of nursing and its consequences that it's led to and deracialized behaviors. Some of the actions that it's gonna take is individual and collective transformation in the profession, movement building, racial equity policies, especially those targeting anti-Black racism. For example, are nurses teaching the true history of our profession? and from whose perspective? How are we introducing whiteness in the nursing curriculum? Are we framing our curriculum within a socio-political context? What do we consider knowledge or evidence within the profession? Are we perpetuating racial essentialism, race essentialism, which is scientific racism? Do we speak to power and systems of oppression as it relates to health. Are we bold enough to call out racism and white supremacy within nursing education or practice? Are we bold to sit inside discomfort and allow it to make us grow? In our processes, are we asking critical questions with admission of students, with hiring of faculty and leadership? And what does that look like? What does pay 
and compensation look like, as well as policies? What values do they reflect? And what does the budget reflect? What perspectives are being centered in our work and throughout our processes? In our research, who owns the data and output, particularly when you're working from a community-based um, participatory action perspective? Who determines the agenda? What are the paradigms used? Are we constantly employing deficit versus asset-based frames of reference in our decision-making? So in doing this work, it can be a liberating process that can lead us to liberation. And liberating ourselves by both resisting oppressive, oppressive practices as well as participating in them. As someone who I follow and read a lot about Dr. Ishiyama Aparo, who is a pediatrician and internal medicine physician, she declares we must know what are we trying to do related to anti-racism? Write it down. For example, be less reactive to white supremacy or recognize and interrupt your white fragility. We all must live our stated values and recognize we are in conflict with them in order to disrupt these patterns. Also, it's important to know anti-racism is hard work and it's not pretty work. And we have to make sure in this process of doing this work that we're nourishing ourselves in ways that are meaningful to us. So we might have to set boundaries. We might have to say no so that we don't overextend ourselves. And we definitely have to affirm our humanity. A big piece is imagination. We have to implement visualization meditation. We need to understand if we are wanting to strive towards anti-racism, what does you, your future self, look like? So for your future self engaged in anti-racism efforts, how do you spend your time? How do you care for yourself? How do you prioritize your activities? Then note what you need to let go of to achieve these goals. Be clear on what the gap between who you are right now and who that future self is. Ask why is the person I see in the future, not now? Our thoughts and narratives can get in the way. Remove what's not serving you and make space for you right now. In liberating yourself towards anti-racism, we have to dream, and I call this freedom dream. This requires imagination and courage to imagine better, different, and courage is having the power to dream. Because whatever is in reality is created twice, once in your imagination and second in reality. And liberation begins with imagination for all of us because this is where oppression situates itself in order to draw power. Imagination powers our thoughts, actions, strategies, and innovation. What is possible is only limited by our imagination to be different. And this desire powers our willingness to then act. We have to have the courage to build a new tomorrow that we all desire and want. That is, and this often is linked with our fears. In this process, ask yourself, what are you afraid of when you're taking these steps and these actions? Because fear is a tool of oppression to maintain the status quo. Another quote that Dr. Oparo states is, fear can be perceived as false evidence appearing real. And what we want to do in this movement is instead think of it as face everything and rise. Ask yourself, are you willing to give power and sacrifice and be inconvenient? And also ask, how am I participating in, benefiting from, and perpetuating and reinforcing systems of oppression? With what I have discussed here, to act towards a more racially just profession, 
nurses are going to have to be bold and accountable. We must confront and work through our fears, our anxieties, guilt, rage, whatever emotion you have. Because as Audrey Lord states, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. So just in some take home messages that I really wanna make sure are highlighted, racism was created by man. So since racism was created, it can be undone. It can be undone if nurses understand why it was constructed, how it functions, and how it is maintained and unapologetically, unapologetically want to destroy it. Nursing is part of the greater society and the lack of a structural orientation in nursing serves to reinforce the emphasis on individual. We have to look at systems and structures. Nurses must have serious discussions about racism and race in America and recognize that racism is endemic in our profession and within healthcare. Lack of discussion about racism leads to responses that exacerbate the problem. And please do not perceive racism as solely intentional and deliberate acts that are overt and easy to identify. And recognize beliefs and practices not aligned with professional values of social justice. Act to address social injustice as an individual, within organizations, within communities, and within policies. We are the embodiment of present and past. And I want to close it off here James Baldwin states, not everything that is, uh, that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. We have to move things forward as the fiery truth-telling Dr. King stated and acknowledge, recognize, and admit to racism in our profession and unapologetically act to transform ourselves, our institutions, and our systems that nursing has created because our institutions and systems are made up of people. I also wanna highlight that it is imperative and I applaud all nurses on this session to really go back and review the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing. They just recently released their report um, and it has a document outlining several different areas of policy, research, education. Um, please give feedback. It's open until February 14th for feedback and your voices must be heard. These are some references here that I've used. And I also just wanted to um, leave some contact information um, in case anyone wanted to contact me by Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. And I wanna thank you for your attention. So Dr. Waite, I have to say, <laughs> I was so taken in by your words of wisdom and your talk that I forgot I was hosting this event <laughs> and stopped paying attention to the Q&A and the chat. Um, I'm particularly moved by lots of what you said, but so what does my future self look like in this fight really resonated uh, with me. You've got lots of outstandings here in the chat. You will be able to see them later. I do have two people that I do want to shout out as I've been following their, their conversation back and forth. Dr. Peggy Chin, um, editor of Advances in Nursing Science, among other things, a social justice warrior herself and former Penn Nursing Dean, Dr. Uh, Afaf Malis, um, have been having a really beautiful conversation in the chat. And you did garner quite a few questions and we do have a few minutes. So 
We'll try to get you to answer some of these questions before your family takes you away for your your birthday dinner. We don't want to spoil that for sure. But um, quite a few of the questions that came in um, during your talk, and actually we solicited some questions prior to um, uh, as people registered. Um, quite a few of them um, revolve around education. Um, so I'm going to try to summarize them um, into one question, but I think um, you'll be able to address the, the few questions that came in. And I think you started to talk about this in the in your talk, particularly when you were um, sharing um, important information around racial literacy. Um, but I think the crux of the question that people are asking about education really focuses on how do we incorporate anti-racism, the true history of nursing, um, and other sorts of discussions of racism into programs and uh, curricula. So I think that summarizes a number of questions we got around education and would love to hear your thoughts um, around that. Yeah, you know, I guess in general, what I would say is we have to really broaden our knowledge and incorporate literature and incorporate information that all of us have probably had in many of our other courses, even from our history courses, but specifically delving deeply when we want to focus on nursing, we have to broaden it and not only look at it from a very narrow lens. We really have to start reading things we have not read before and incorporate that information. It's out there. It's not that it's not out there. We have not incorporated and may not have seen it of value, um, but it's really important to be um, not limited in our perspectives that we showcase and highlight for our students because they deserve to have the true authentic information um, based on you know how our profession was built, who has participated in our profession, who has not been elevated, right? Whose work has not been elevated, that needs to be elevated within the space, within our profession. They need to see themselves. All of our students need to see themselves in the work that we're teaching them. Absolutely, um, and that actually, that answer segues into a question about representation and imagery in nursing, and this is, um, a question uh, from Dr. Melise, specifically in the global uh, space of nursing, um, and so nursing centers, Florence Nightingale. Uh, we at Penn Nursing are beginning our own conversations about uh, Nightingale and and who we we portray in our school of nursing. Um, you know, I have my own sentiments. We don't necessarily need to remove Nightingale, but we also need to elevate other other exactly. images, right? I think this, and, and present the whole truth, right? So um, to that end, could you maybe elaborate a little bit more about ways or give advice about how we can um, present a more diverse and global image of nursing that doesn't center Nightingale? Yeah, I, I really do think it stems back to learning. And I, I actually can just give myself an example because through my education, this was not incorporated. So through my work and evolving um, and my work in anti-racism and digger, digging deeper into nursing, I myself have had to learn more and read about individuals I knew nothing about <laughs> because I wasn't exposed to it. So I really think we really have to read and we have to learn and uplift others formally before formal educational programs, but we have had healers within the space that have been doing nursing before nursing programs developed within in different countries, not just within the United States, and really infuse that information so that we can learn. Because there's so much more out there that even I don't know. But we have to be intentional with it because it's not going to fall in our lap. Absolutely, and you know, and I, I do say this all the time. I think my colleagues might might be sick and tired of hearing. This is not an easy task we are asking individuals. So no one says that it's easy, but there is a level of labor and self learning that many of us um, need to do, continue to do, in order to incorporate these things into um, curriculum. 
I also well, think, you know, we yeah. can I also think, you know, since we know this work and this information is out there, we can't be ignorant. We can't say because we weren't taught it, we can't um, seek to learn. Anything else that we want to learn more about, we want to improve our investments, we do some financial work, we do the same thing in this space here as well. So we know that there's information out there, we know others have contributed in momentous ways. We have to discover and read and share. Absolutely. Um, there's another question here. I, I, it might be a little bit difficult, but again, I think it's an important conversation to have. Um, and so a question came in, how do we reconcile those harmed by detrimental behaviors? Um, I'm, I'm a believer of ownership, acknowledging, um, because it's not the intent, it's the impact, right? So we have to have some form of acknowledgement and some form of restoration and um, really actually having that desire to change to move forward. So it really is really a deep personal commitment um, to moving forward. And in this process that I see of sort of this growth and learning, so many people become immobilized because of that fear, right? Or saying the wrong thing or not knowing or being perfect within this space. And this is a learning endeavor for all of us. And if we don't move, we're never gonna act and we're never going to create these changes. And to me, it is injustice to continue to harm individuals when you know you're doing it, just because there's some levels of discomfort. Definitely, for sure. Um, I think we'll do two more questions uh, before we we uh, close the program. Um, and this is a question that comes up almost every time we have an event um, uh, discussing racism and bias. Um, and so I'm going to reframe the way the question was posed to me, but the intent is still the same. What advice do you have for allies um, who want to be supportive? Um, may not be black or a person of color, but are, are interested in, in wanting to help. What, what advice would you share with our would-be allies? You know, I actually think, you know, there are many things, but I would say to start, start with self. Because oftentimes I think people want to act without knowing really what they want to act for, or even understanding how, you know, trying to change the problem, but not really having an understanding of the problem itself. So there's a lot of self-learning and there's a lot of self-work that needs to occur with allies. And it's not saying you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. They can still you know, advocate, they can still read, they could you know, continue to educate themselves and their own groups, how they um, might influence policy. There is multifaceted, but I do think it starts with self. And I think it starts with, um, learning things they definitely have not known before or did not know, you know, previously. Dr. Kenty, you just showed yours. Are you are you wanting to share a question for them? I, I know Dr. Kenty has some, some words of wisdom <laughs> I, here. Yeah, I just wanted to say, yes, I just want to say if you want to be an ally, if you want to educate yourself, will your actions say, how is this going to help address racism? Not make me feel better. Because a lot of times when you're an ally, things look pretty good for you. So you have to ask yourself that question. How is this going to help someone black? How is it going to help another person of color? Because I think that when you start to think about the impact of your actions, there's more meaning to it. And even, I just have to say this just really quickly, like someone put in the chat, like how does racism impact patient safety? If you're asking that question, there's, you have to do the work. Yeah. Do your own research to understand so that you could be a better position that your question may be differently. But I think that we're all in different levels of addressing racism and we acknowledge that, but we all have to be on this path to decolonize nursing. Even if you think it doesn't impact you, you need to get on this path because it's gonna happen whether you want it to or not and you don't wanna get left behind. But, even, but think about just doing real actions and we all know when someone asks us a question, like a direction, we just say, oh, just go down the street or just get on MapQuest. 
or we could say, you know, you have to be careful going down that street. Turn this way because it's safer or there's a lot of traffic. So we have to decide how much we want to invest. It is hard work. It's a lot of hard work, but you have to be willing, willing to do it. And we and have to do it for our profession. And I think a big thing you said, Dr. Canty, is that it is work. And it is a degree of work that individuals have to do. It's not something that someone else is going to teach them. They have to do some work. Thank you, so both of you. Thank you, both of you. Maybe we should have had a panel discussion here. That might have even been um, more exciting, though I don't know how much more we could have added to Dr. Waite's uh, talk. Um, just one more question um, changes the conversation just a little bit, um, but it's a question um, that asks you to think about um, the nursing determinants of health that continue to support and actually foster healthcare disparities um, in our system, in our healthcare systems, um, and actually in the country. So I think. The intent of the question is that there are still some things in nursing that are continuing to support and foster health disparities. And um, if I didn't get that absolutely right, Dr. Fields, you can put in the chat, but I think that is the intent of your question. So hopefully I didn't butcher it and um, you understood the question, Dr. Waite. And we'll, we'll, we'll use that as the last question. What are we doing in nursing that's continuing to perpetuate health disparities? I would actually say one thing that I actually talked about in my talk, and that's scientific racism, how and what we're teaching. Um, and that does harm, um, you know, our patients. So identifying things that are race-based when it's based on racism and not race is key. And I see that continuously happening over and over and over again. And it's something that we really have to be intentional about. And there's a long history there, but we really have to be intentional in, um, in undoing that practice, let's just say that. And be very clear when we're creating cases for students, when we're in a hospital and you might see, um, you know, fellow nurses sharing information, we have to use every moment as an education because uh, oftentimes race is identified as the vulnerability and it's racism that creates the vulnerability for individuals. Well said, and I think with that, we will we'll end the formal part of this um, fabulous event. Um, Doctors Waite and Kenti, I wanna thank you for, your, for both of your dynamite keynotes and performances. Um, there are a few other thank yous I need to uh, make sure get get done. So Amber Banayad, who's the program coordinator for, for the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Uh, Anthony Aji, our IT expert, who um, I think we just bother right up until <laughs> we go live. He, uh, he's always, often always so patient with us. Uh, Janet Tomkavich for help with advertising. Kayla Lockwood for the beautiful marketing flyer and Nicole Wolverton, who um, helps to put together materials for us and, and the Dean. I wanna thank all of those people. I wanna thank all of you in the audience, the virtual audience um, for your time. You could have been anywhere on a Friday afternoon going into the evening and you chose to share some of your time with us. Um, and I think you would say it was time well spent. Um, American poet Amanda Gorman uses images of light and darkness in her inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb, to contrast the opposing side of America. A couple of lines from her poem resonate with me and actually remind me of um, both our keynote speaker and our guest performer, um, their character and conviction. So the lines are, for there is always a light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Dr. Waite, uh, Dr. Canty, you certainly demonstrated that braveness um, in being a light for nursing. Um, and I wanna thank you for all that you are doing. Um, thank you everyone, um, be safe, stay warm, 
Dr. Waite, enjoy your birthday dinner with your family. Congratulations again on being the Dean of Georgetown University. They are in excellent hands. Um, and so for those of you who didn't know, now you know they are in excellent hands. Thank you again, everyone. Um, we are recording. I've gotten a few requests about whether or not we'll be able to share your talk, Dr. Waite. So uh, the recording will be available um, uh, to you all and we'll, get, we'll make sure those who registered uh, get a link to the recording. Thank you again for spending your time with us. Thank you again, Dr. Waite. Thank you again, Dr. Canty. Um, everyone else have a very good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.